The gentleman from Colorado is recognized for one hour. Madam Speaker, for the purposes of debate only, I yield the customary 30 minutes to my friend, the gentleman from Oklahoma, Mr. Cole, pending which I yield myself such time as I may consume. The gentleman is recognized. During consideration of this resolution, all time is yielded for purposes of debate only. I ask unanimous consent that all members be given five legislative days to revise and extend their remarks. It's order. Madam Speaker, the Rules Committee met and reported a rule, House Resolution 131, providing for the consideration of the conference report to accompany H.J. Res 31, the Consolidated Appropriations Act of 2019. The rule provides for consideration of the legislation under a conference report rule and provides for one hour of, a de of debate. The rule also provides for standard recess procedures through Friday, February 22nd. Madam Speaker, this legislation has been a long time coming. In December, the Senate passed a clean re continuing resolution for the seven appropriations bills which hadn't been completed. The President said at the time he would sign that bill. But then the President changed course and demanded $5.7 billion for his campaign promise of a border wall. As we now know, this led to the longest government shutdown in United States history, 35 days. This put our country in jeopardy by withholding paychecks for 800,000 federal employees who are patriots and provide critical services to our country and to all Americans. Put simply, this was not an issue worth shutting down the federal government. That is why I'm pleased we're here today to avoid another shutdown and begin to get the agencies affected by the shutdown back on track. This bill provides appropriations for the seven remaining appropriations bills through the end of the fiscal year, including agriculture and rural development, commerce, justice, and science, financial services and general government, homeland security, interior and environment, state and foreign operations and transportation, housing, and urban development. Over the past six weeks, we heard testimony from the chairs and ranking members of the Appropriations Committee numerous times as we tried to reopen the government last month. A constant theme from those hearings from both Democrats and Republicans was a respect for the appropriators and their ability to negotiate a deal. Today's result is confirmation of that trust we place in our appropriators. And I want to congratulate all the committee members and staff for their work over the last few weeks. The conference report in front of us today is by no means perfect, but it represents a compromise between Democrats and Republicans and between the House and the Senate. And there are many programs well funded by this bill. For instance, the Census Bureau will see an increase of more than a billion dollars as they prepare for the 2020 Census to ensure an accurate count. NASA which invests heavily in Colorado and, and across all of the country, will see a $763 million increase over last year to fully fund NASA's science mission directorates and support human exploration from the International Space Station to the moon and on to Mars by 2033. This legislation provides $17 billion in funding for new infrastructure investments in roads, bridges, transit, and housing, and the bill blocks attempts by the White House to hamstring the EPA and other agencies from protecting our environment. And importantly, the bill overrides the President's decision to freeze federal employee pay this year. Instead, it provides a 1.9 percent pay raise for all federal employees. This conference agreement also makes smart investments in border security by investing $755 million in infrastructure and technology at ports of entry, additional funds to hire customs agents, $563 million for immigration judges to reduce the backlog, and humanitarian aid for Central American countries and along our border to those who need the help. The bill also provides $1.375 billion for border fencing with restrictions protecting sensitive areas and local involvement, and takes steps to reduce the immigration detention bed levels for which I'm confident the House will provide rigorous oversight. Madam Speaker, there are a few things missing from this agreement 
to help us repair the damage from the longest partial government shutdown in United States history. First, the bill does not provide federal contractors back pay from the shutdown. Federal contractors often work side by side with other federal employees and perform jobs important to the country and all Americans. These contractors did nothing wrong and deserve to be made whole, just like the 800,000 federal employees who missed paychecks. Congress needs to work together and make this right. Additionally, during the shutdown, my state of Colorado, along with California, Louisiana, Vermont, and Washington, took steps to ensure fairness for accepted federal employees to make them eligible for unemployment insurance because they were forced to continue working without knowing when they would be paid. Unemployment be benefits are a lifeline for situations just like this where there's nowhere else to go. But unfortunately, the United States Department of Labor chose to make it more difficult for states to provide these benefits. The department has said it will not reimburse states for these legitimate costs and has threatened additional penalties putting earned benefits for other unemployed workers at risk. I'm a co-sponsor of legislation introduced by Representative Katie Hill from California which would clarify current law and ensure our states are reimbursed as intended by Congress. For reasons I don't quite understand, my friends on the other side of the aisle would not accept this provision and I plan to continue working with Representative Katie Hill and Chairman Rich, Richie Neal from the Ways and Means Committee to help states like Colorado. Additionally, I worked to introduce two pieces of legislation during the shutdown to help federal employees deal with the effects of the shutdown. First was H.R. 545, the Financial Relief for Feds Act, which was introduced by Representative Pete Olson from Texas and Representative Don Beyer from Virginia and me. And this was to ensure federal employees who made withdrawals during a shutdown from their thrift savings plans or other retirement accounts weren't penalized for their early withdrawals. TSP saw a 35 percent increase in hardship withdrawals during the shutdown as federal employees did anything they could to help pay their bills. And I hope our legislation is considered by the House quickly to make these federal employees whole again. I also introduced H.R. 781, the Student Loan Relief for Feds Act, with Representative Will Hurd from Texas to allow federal employees to defer their student loans without penalty during a government shutdown. A typical student loan payment is between 200 and 300 per month, and that's money you don't have if you're not getting a paycheck. These examples of legislation, these are examples of legislation we need to pass to fix problems creating, created during the shutdown. And there's one more bill I'll be introducing today. I just put it in the hopper to prevent these shutdowns from ever happening again. If Congress and the White House have a political disagreement, our federal employees and the American people shouldn't be the pawns who suffer the consequences of the disagreement. My bill, the No More Shutdowns Act, provides automatic continuing appropriations for any fiscal year when appropriations haven't been enacted. This means whenever there would be a lapse in appropriations, funding would continue at previously enacted levels, along with an increase for, to the account for inflation until Congress passes an appropriation bill. This is common sense and would allow our federal agencies to continue their work without the start and stop of shutdowns and short-term CRs. I hope my colleagues on both sides of the aisle will join me in working to make sure shutdowns do not happen again. Overall, Mr. S Madam Speaker, this is a good compromise to fully fund these agencies so we can finish last year's work and allow Congress to move on to other important issues that we were sent here to do, like reducing health care costs and repairing infrastructure across the country. I urge all my colleagues to support the rule and the underlying conference, conference agreement, and I reserve the balance of my time. Gentleman reserves. Gentleman from Oklahoma is recognized. Uh, thank you, Madam Freak. 